Hello, Renegade Marketers. Welcome to Renegade Marketers Unite, the top-rated podcast for B2B CMOs and other marketing-obsessed individuals. Alrighty, folks, you're about to listen to a bonus huddle, a specially curated huddle that we run once a month with experts sharing their insights into topics that are most important to our B2B community, also known as CMO huddles. The expert at this particular huddle was the well-renowned make that the world-renowned researcher, co-author of The Challenger Sale, and five-time guest, you should probably get a jacket for that, on Renegade Marketers Unite, Brent Adamson. We had a really insightful, challenging, humorous conversation on how CMOs can recession-proof their marketing, demonstrate value, and increase customer satisfaction. I know you're going to enjoy it. Let's dive in. Welcome to a very special bonus huddle. Our guest today is Brent Adamson, best-selling author of The Challenger Sale and The Challenger Customer. And oh, by the way, wrote the forward to some book called Renegade Marketing, 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands. Brent is one of the most sought-after advisors in sales and marketing in the world and spent the last two decades researching the B2B buying process, which he declared is entirely broken. After five years at Gartner and 14 years at CEB before that, Brent joined Ecosystem this April as their global head of research and communities. We will find out what he is doing there. Um, he's been a frequent guest on Renegade Marketers Unite. And when we caught up earlier this summer, I mentioned our huddles on recession preparedness, and he leapt at the chance to had, add his voice to this conversation. So, Brent, welcome. Thank you, Drew. It's good to be with all of you guys. It's great to see all of you and I hope everyone is doing well. And I will, I'll do my best to share a perspective that's hopefully interesting, if nothing else, but uh, great always interesting, always interesting. So also, where are you? I'm in my home office, uh, where I have spent the last three years of my life, not being on airplanes. Uh, this is in Northern Virginia. So Dulles airports right over there, uh, about seven o'clock at night, the Frankfurt flight comes right over the house in a 747 <laughs> and I'm not on it, but there you go. So that's where I'm at. Awesome. So we will get to ecosystems because I think it's really relevant to this discussion, but let's yeah. stay big picture for a second. Sure. What do your spidey senses tell you about a possible recession? Uh, so first of all, I am not an economist. I just read the same headlines you guys all read. So I, I think the thing that to me that's really interesting is just how complex the story is, right? So, you know, employment's up strong. Uh, inflation, of course, numbers out just yesterday uh, looks like uh, particularly bad, even when you discount the fact that gasoline prices have been diminishing. The war in Ukraine is taking an interesting turn. Uh, of course, that has huge implications for supply chain. And the supply chain stuff gets really interesting. I was talking to a global head of sales yesterday at a paper company, and a lot of their products rely on on recycled goods, you know, like you, when you buy paper products, it says made from 20% recycled goods. But what I didn't know, it turns out that most of the, the input materials that they use to make those goods comes from recycled paper from offices, but no one's in offices right now. So they have a supply chain problem That's because right. people aren't working, people are working from home. And the right. reason I tell you that story is just to show you just, I would have never thought of that. Do you know what I mean? Just, just, I guess that the, my point is simply, it's just, there's so many different moving parts yeah. So many different dimensions that I think not a single one of us has been able to fully put together because the reality we live in today is so different from three years ago. For those of you guys, uh, well, for all of us, and particularly in marketing, I think there's this, this will be part of the bigger theme of what I've been talking about a lot lately is there's just a really strong opportunity for us, all of us as, as partner suppliers, vendors, brands today to play a role in what I would call frame making, which is just help people make sense out of it. I, I would love for someone to just say, I don't look, I don't know if there's a recession coming, but here's the three things to watch for. Or I don't know if there's a recession coming or not, but what if there is or not, either, either way, here's two things you need to be thinking about. Those are, I think, the kinds of conversations that we could and should be having with customers right now to, to help us. Because I don't know, it's like, period. I'll just stop there. Take a breath. Well, <laughs> and it, so it's interesting. So I, I was talking to a CMO who was at a conference uh, with other CMOs and about one third of them were already seeing uh, 2023 budget declines, not just right. budget freezes, yeah. but budget declines. So, yeah. you know, part of this answer is, and, and I'm not an economist either, although I did 
was one of the majors that I had in, in college, is the U.S. economy is a lot stronger than the global economy, but mm. the U.S. economy is not immune to the global economy. So, yeah. you know, we're just right now with full employment as it is, it's going to be slower to hit us. But yeah. for global companies, it's it's probably already here in so many different dimensions, because if there's less money to spend, because more money being spent on your regular goods, that's hard. And that's yeah. going to have a ripple effect all the way around. Okay, let's move on. So let's talk about this. And we talked a lot about this in in, uh, in 2020 in particular. There was this moment right after the p- pandemic began where the CFO became the CF no. <laughs> And we laughed about it and it was a, but it was in a really important shift because what happened in that very first part of the pandemic was very telling. As we start to think about strategic shifts that brands will need to think about, we're going to start to get to this buyer trepidation, right? We're just going to, we're going to say, ah, do I really need to buy this now? What kinds of things are you thinking about or, you know, will we go back to the playbook of essentialness that we had as in, uh, the part of 2020 or are we going to be new things? Well, so so a couple of thoughts. Uh, you know, there's, there's there's so many dimensions to this answer, but here, here's a, a couple of things I think we should all be thinking about. So number one is so we it, you know to degrees you get to like know a little bit more about the company that I'm working with a company called Ecosystems, and I I, I want to be careful I don't become a shill for a product that's a really cool platform. But I will tell you the world that I live in now, the the environment the uh, is um, at this company called Ecosystems, the world of value, and there's a reason why I'm here talking about value with this company because I think in a time like this, as we all know to be true, at any altitude, whether it's at a very tactical level, like just explaining, justifying the size of your own team to your CFO, or, you know, uh, helping your customer understand the need for your solution when they're all on the sidelines and becoming incredibly risk averse. I think the way that you inoculate yourself against a recession or against tough times or risk aversion from your customers, one of them at least, is to be able to clearly articulate the value of what you're doing in the first place. Why is it? And and I think that to bring in a little bit of a sprinkle of the challenger work that we've done in the past, it's not so much what is the value of your product or the value of your solution or the value of your team or the value of this software platform for your company. It's the value of the outcome that that relationship that that investment leads to, right? And that's actually different, right? So it's like, because the reason why it's different is, let's say I'm going to have a discussion with my customer on the value of my solution. Well, then I got to talk about, well, here's this, you know, the, the total cost of ownership or the lifetime value. We spend a lot of time putting the calculators together. I think the better way to think about it is to sit down with your customer collaboratively or do it through digital because we're marketers, right? Is think about what are the outcomes that you're trying to achieve irrespective of the means of getting there? What's the what's the end and, and what is the value of that end? And that's where I think a little bit of the challenger work is still absolutely um, applicable, which is here's what you're trying to do. Here's a different thing to try to do and why it's actually better because it can help you save money or make money in different ways you hadn't even thought possible. So building the value out of that course of action, whether it's one your customers are on already or one that you actually challenge them to be on, but then to build out sort of like, how do I explain, or how do we discover together why that matters? Right. And then, and then, and then make it very concrete from that point. So it can't just be like, it matters for these very abstract reasons. What are the KPIs? What are the metrics? What are the targets? So as I, you know, I put it the other, I was at the Pulse conference a couple of weeks ago. That's the Gainsight conference. And I, the way I put it, someone is like, what are we trying to do? And how will we know when we get there? Those are the two questions. What are we trying to do? And then how exactly are we going to know when we get there? Very tactically, very practically, what are the steps we can take? And, I, and when I look at, you know, like the typical value calculators or the total cost of ownership, all the different ROI calculations a lot of us do on behalf of our reps or put on our website, I think there needs to be a first step around aligning around that first question. What are we trying to do in the first place? And then figuring out, all right, irrespective of whether you don't work with us or, or use our solution, why would that be valuable to you? What are you going to get from that? What are the metrics? And, and then getting alignment among the customer stakeholders around that. So do we all agree that that's the right outcome? outcome? Do we all agree that those are the metrics that we all believe in? Do we all agree that those are the right targets? But I think if you're not buttoned down on these kinds of discussions with your customer, or more importantly, irrespective of you, if your customer's not buttoned down on these kinds of points, it's going to be very hard for anyone to take action in the face of the uncertainty that we see today. That'd be my take. I want to break this down a little bit and get into it yeah. because you also said in that conversation, save money, make money. And yeah. most businesses are- Or mitigate this, risk. That's the other or, one. So right. save, save money, make money, mitigate risk. Those are usually, the, almost everything ladders up to those three. Right. That's it right. ladders up to that. But what you're really talking about is 
and and there's a time frame, by the way, with that too as well, right? How quickly you yeah. can do it. Because one of the things that was really interesting in the beginning of the uh, pandemic was mm -hmm. if you had a long, more than a three month payback, CFO is mm. just saying, no, I don't have time. I got immediate things that I need to fix now, like digital yeah. transformation. Yours is a year payback. That's great, but I don't have a year. If we're not talking about saving money, and we're not talking mm -hmm. about making money and we're not talking about doing it in a certain time frame because that's one way of looking at value. What are we talking about? And, and, and how do we get more, a little more specific to help folks? And, and I, it probably depends on, on the folks' industries, but this is where we sort of, and this is really jumping ahead, but this is sort of save money, make money in a certain time frame is the rational. And then we know there's this emotional component, but help dimensionalize this idea. And then uh, there's another the, whole area to which talk idea about. do you want do you want to dig onto the emotional side drew is that well, what you want to let's, dig in? let's or, first get to value and why yeah. what matters and, and really sort of if it's not on the dimensions of help you make money save money what are we looking at or give an example so just so that we're clear that we're talking about something that folks uh, on this call can do i think it's easy to mm. say it's easier for for folks to understand because we've talked a lot about this in in the huddles is yeah. if i can show that my product or service let's take a piece of software can pay back 3x in 3 months i got a really good value proposition yay i can do this and that's clear and that's a very clear rational quick payback you'll make more money or you, you know, our product will pay back and help you do this. Although, you know, look, if I was competing against that product, I'd, you know, I, I think I would, my, my have a longer payback period, but a better pay, uh, but a better payback over time. That's the conversation I want to have is like, let me show you why your short sightedness is going to bite you in the derriere you know, a year from now. Like, you know, so the, I think it's a really good conversation to have around is a three month time frame actually the right kind of time frame because the, the kinds of changes, these tectonic shifts we're seeing and moving towards digital, for example, as you mentioned, that's not a three month journey. That's a multi-year journey. And it's a really interesting to begin to have a conversation around how do you make sure that the decisions you're making right now for short-term survival don't undermine your opportunity for long-term growth. And I think that's, that's first of all, that's a really interesting conversation. Let me, if I could, I'll, I'll take it in a slightly different direction. There's a, I guess, a, a keynote and a set of content I've been running lately, which I think is, if I take everything that we learned at Gartner over the last four or five years and all, everything I'm seeing now in this value space that I'm working in, the number one thing that we all can be thinking about right now in B2B commerce, particularly as marketers and sellers, is solving for what I would call customer confidence. And, and the thing that's so interesting right now, and this all plays into the uncertainty story that we're laying out here. The number one thing that we saw in Gartner research, right, in the last couple of years, particularly prior to my departure, was if you're looking for the one thing you can do to increase the likelihood of your customers buying a bigger deal on purpose of feeling good about it, is the degree to which they feel confident, not in you, not in your brand, not in your product, not in your speeds and feeds, but the degree to which they feel confident in themselves themselves and their ability to make that decision on behalf of their company. And when you think about that, so I tell CEOs all the time, like run everything through the lens of customer confidence. Our job as a supplier, as a, as a partner, is to make customers feel better about themselves, more confident in their ability to decide things. This isn't about buying things, it's about deciding things. And I think right now there are three major forces that are eroding customer confidence. One is decision complexity. One is information overwhelmedness or information overload. We'll call it that over, overwhelmedness. I'm not sure that's where. So we'll call it decision complexity, information overload. And then the third one is the one I mentioned already is value opacity. And if someone's got a better word for opacity that doesn't sound so wonky, I'm, I'm totally open to it and throw it in the chat. But uh, so decision complexity, information overload, value opacity are three major forces undermining customers' confidence in their own ability to decide inside their company. So decision complexity, it's all the different stakeholders, it's all the different concerns, it's all the, like customers don't know how to buy. Who do I get involved? What questions are gonna come up? What's gonna blow up in our faces? When deals go off the rails, I can guarantee you more often than not, the customer didn't see it coming. It's because they don't understand how to buy given their own internal decision-making complexity. So there's an, so that's one. Information overload is the sense-making work that I put in HBR with the team at, uh, at Gartner right before I left around customers are overwhelmed with high quantities of high quality information. This is where our thought leadership strategy backfires because you're saying smart stuff. I'm saying smart stuff. We're all in the smartness arms race to prove to our customers we're the smartest company in the world. And we just leave our customers confused at a higher level because you're telling me to zig. They're telling me to zag. Everybody's got great information or you all still sound the same because you're all sounding smart and I just don't know what to do. So I just choose not to choose. 
And then the third was the value opacity point that I already made around it's unclear, you know, around the outcomes, the metrics, the targets, and are, are we all aligned? So if we think about it, if I put all that, I promise I'm, 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 I'm heading for a final here, but here's, let me sum it up for you, Drew, is that, you know, so much of Challenger was all about being frame breaking, like, you know, uh, so unteaching, uh, breaking your customer's mental model, giving them a new way of thinking. And I still think that's valid. But I think the opportunity today in this environment where customers are overwhelmed across those three dimensions around decision, around information, around value, that there's this really interesting opportunity for us to sort of shift our perspective from frame breaking and just saying really smart, challenging stuff, which is still good, move from frame breaking to frame making, which is how can I create a framework for my customers that will help them feel more confident to move forward with a decision? I think you can build a framework around decision making. You can build a framework around information. And you can build a framework around value. Those are just three different ways that one can play the role of a frame maker. This is a world where frame making, if what you're solving for is customer confidence, the reason I like this word framework is you're not telling them what to do. You're giving them a framework, a scaffold, if you want to get into like behavioral cognitive psychology stuff, which is really interesting. You're giving them a, a, a framework for them to organize their own thinking. Like, so I, I can give you a framework for buying. Here's the three steps you want to consider. Here's the five people you probably want to include. Here's the three things you want to think about. I can give you a framework around information that's sense-making. Here's the, here's the three questions you need to ask yourself as you consume this information. Here's the two pieces of information you really want to take a look at. And one may be from our competitor. And I could put a framework around value, which is, that's the company I work at now. It's literally our software platform is a, is a tool to put framework around value. But in this frame-making approach, the, one of the things I think is about, so interesting about it, Drew, and uh, it'd be interesting to get people's thoughts in the chat is it's very Socratic, right? So in other words, the idea here is that I'm creating frameworks to simplify. I'm helping customers just make sense of their world, to, to organize and, and simplify and analyze their world so they can come to their own conclusions because they've got to own that decision because that's what you're solving for is their confidence and their ability to make that decision. So it's, it's less about telling them what to do and just giving them a fighting chance to decide what to do. And, and so that the Socratic approach, I think, is, um, is this a really interesting way to think about how we go to market. Is, so you guys think about website design, for example. What information can we put on our website and how can we organize it so that when customers encounter our website and work their way through it, they find, I love these guys. They helped me come to a decision as opposed to they told me what to do or they told me that they were found in the back of a pickup truck on 1892 and they showed me all their logos. Sorry, that was a bit of a dig. That was unfair. But the uh, <laughs> that's, that's what, but uh, we do that because we all do that. So, but uh, what, oh, I got one more. Then, then I promise I will take a breath. There's but a there, lot there, to unpack here. So I yes. know, I know. But there, there's, <laughs> but let me, but here's how we could sum it up. So rather than unpacking it, let's, let me put a point on it. Okay. There's a guy named Brian Smith. That's Brian with a Y. Brian Smith is the chief strategy officer at a company called Expedient. It's a cloud computing company. He was the head of sales. He's also now the chief strategy officer. Brian is, he's brilliant. He's really, really smart. I've heard Brian say to his team, and I just love this. I, I permission to say this, but I, see, I've heard him say to his team, our job is to help our customers make the best decision they can in as little time as possible. That's our job. How can we help our customers make the best decision that they can in as little time as possible? Why as little time as possible? Because we're going to lose the old saying in sales, we're going to lose, lose early, right? It's like, but I want to be the company that's being helpful. I said, so you know, this is a shift from how do we get our customers to buy to how do we help our customers decide? That in a time of uncertainty, go full circle to where we started. I think that's our opportunity, whether it's success, sales, marketing, service, so that's, in some that's ways, the bandwagon I'm on these days. Drew. No, I don't and in some ways, though, because I no. remember uh, you at a Gardner conference and the big slide that said, make buying easier, where you're being more specific now in yeah. the sense that we've, we're, we are making buying easier by creating a framework that helps them have the confidence to make a decision because most of the time, and this is your language, pain a change versus gain a change, right? Most of the time- Technically, the pain... it's ADP's language. They're the All ones right. that came up with it. Yeah, but well, right. good. I'm, uh, yeah, but, we've put it in the, the book, so I'll, I'll the, claim to it. Yeah, yeah, it's in your book. That we're competing with, if particularly in a software world, you're competing with uh, gain of changes is rarely as, as high as you would like it to be versus the pain of change. So we're yeah. creating this framework and we're doing it yeah. in three ways. We're helping them- with decisions, with info and showing value. Now, yeah. the value to me is, and that's what ecosystems does as yeah. I understand it. And yeah. we can pause on that. And then yeah. there's decision making and then there's information, all of which is about making it easy for me to buy, right? And well, it's, it's funny, not, not think, just making not, it I mean, easy, but, but make me make me confident. I, yeah, right. exactly. I would, right. We used right. to run everything through the easy lens. I would right, run right, everything right. now through the confidence lens. Confidence yeah. lens. And I and it's funny because yeah. I 
and this may not be a parallel, but what I'm immediately thinking of is, is a lot of car advertising is mm -hmm. for the person who already bought the car. They see the ad and they go, oh, I feel better about making that decision because look, there it is. And it looks so good on TV. It's an interesting yeah. aspect. So it's yeah. reinforcing. There's no buyer's remorse, right? When you do it. So you're trying to sort of address buyer's remorse early, get to confidence. All right. It's easy to say that word. <laughs> I'm yeah. going to make you confident in buying my product or service. I think I, what I like about this or the, the I'm optimistic about this is I can wrap my head around, okay, what am I doing in these other decision-making info and value? Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. You know, so this stuff can be turned into tactics. So Deidre's point, Deidre, I see your point in the chat. It's like, so, so around, uh, and again, a lot of this is, is inspired by some great work we did at Challenger, but the, uh, around decision complexity, uh, this idea of buyer enablement, and even something in the marketing practice that Gartner, um, uh, Sharon uh, Cantor Cuervas is an incredible researcher, coined this term change enablement, which is how can we you know, buying guides, coaching guides, here are the three people you want to talk to, here's the questions they're going to ask, here's the three steps to avoid, here's a Cosmo quiz, some of you will know what a Cosmo quiz is, here's a quick quiz to determine whether or not you're ready, like a readiness checklist. All these things are very tactical things that we can create in marketing, put on a website, put in the hands of our sales reps to increase customer confidence and their ability to navigate their own decision-making complexity. The, on the information side, that's the article, it's called Sense Making for Sales. I'm not trying to plug my own work, I'm sorry if that sounds self-serving, but it's just a, it's a nice summary of just very practically, how can you you help your customers make sense out of information. There's tactical things that we do there. And around value, again, I think there's just a very tactical set of steps around outcome definition, collaborative defining of outcomes, collaborative defined definition of KPIs, mapping out a, a road or a path to value realization and think about implementation. So the, all these things can be very tactically deployed, which I think is super cool. At the risk of making you show show for your company, I have no problem doing that. Let's go to let's start with value because yep. we've talked about value a lot. We've talked to, in in huddles. We've talked about ROI calculators. We've talked yep. about other ways of showing return on investment and those kinds of things. What yep. is it that you all do, and how how do you how do you get at this issue of of demonstrating value? So it's actually super cool. And I'll, I'll just, if anyone wants to, by all means, hit me up on LinkedIn or, you know, our ecosystems.us is our, is our website. Um, and I'm happy to do a light demo or just talk about it if anyone wants to talk about it. But it's it's a software platform. Everything everything today is SaaS, right? You guys are all probably SaaS too. It's a, SaaS, it's a software as a service platform. And the way I think about this, Drew, is it's almost like an operating system for value. In other words, it, it is a, in, a, a digital environment, a software platform in which customers and sellers and customers can virtually sit down together and, and figure out what are we trying to do with this relationship? What are the outcomes that we're trying to achieve? What are the metrics that matter? How are we going to map out a roadmap to get to that value? And then how do we track that over time? So what we can do is we can populate that platform with hypotheses. So for example, if you're selling to pharmaceuticals, we can tell you, you know, if you're selling a pharmaceutical a solution to pharmaceuticals, here's the three people you need to talk to. Here's the kinds of outcomes they typically care about so that your sales rep now can have essentially what I call hypothesis-led discovery. And they can pull down in the drop-down menu Say, all right, so I noticed this has to come up with it, but uh, when working with other customers like you is my all time favorite phrase and working with other customers like you, one of the things we find is this often comes up. This hasn't come up in our conversation. Would you consider that? You can do the same with targets and metrics. You can build out calculators. You can make them dynamic. So you can do scenario planning. There's a really nice process mapping tool. So you can map out what I would call a sequence of events and create what's known as a verified pipeline. You put all that together, Drew. And it, one of the last things, one of the things we were talking about right before I left Gartner was this idea of a digital sales room, which is a, just a, a sort of a almost like a place in, in the internet where your customers can synchronously and asynchronously interact with you and, and have these conversations. That's not how ecosystems thinks about what they've done. But when I look at it, that's how I think about it. It's essentially, it's, this, it's a digital space, like an operating system on top of which these really great conversations that have been happening for decades through more analog ways can occur uh, and, and can be tracked from all the way from up top of funnel marketing all the way down to you know expansion through customer success teams so super cool stuff part of this is going to existing customers and establishing a value and then yeah. the next part of this is using it as a way of saying this is the value we'll create for you based on the model that we've done for other customers that's right and not surprisingly one of our big customer groups is customer success because you know as, as we all move to not all of us, many of us move to recurring revenue models, right? So subscription based or whatever it might be on a monthly basis. So it used to be I sell a three year contract and leave you alone for two and a half years, right? But now we've now we have to, as you guys know on the marketing side, 
we have to have recurring conversations with our customers often on a monthly basis. If you're selling on a consumption basis, that blows my mind because it's literally in an ongoing real-time basis where your customers can ask and will ask frequently, what are we getting out of this? Should I just shut this off this month? In fact, the way we put it, here's how something for us all, because there's a great campaign around this, which I'm not a campaign builder. I need you guys' help to build a campaign around this, but <laughs> essentially it comes down to this, which is your customer, for, particularly for those of you in SaaS or in recurring revenue models, this is absolutely the case. Your customer is about to have a very difficult conversation about your product with their CFO. That is that is our reality. That's our reality for all of us right now. Your customer is about to have a very tough conversation about your product with their CFO. Here's my question. Are they ready to have that conversation? Which and then that, leads to, are you ready? But are they ready to have that conversation? Because so you're not going to be there. They got to go in and have that conversation without you. Are, have, are they equipped to have that? Are you? Does that make you nervous? Makes me freaking nervous. I'll tell you that. So that's where this stuff becomes really important. So this is very specified buyer enablement, right? This is, you're the leader of this committee who's buying committee. You're mm -hmm. gonna go to the CFO and you're gonna say, we need this now because. Or we already bought it, but why do we still have it? Can we, right. okay. in cost cutting mode, I'm looking to shut things off. I'm looking to like, we that, need, that, if we need to decrease our spend, by the way, this is you guys, right? This is your CFO having conversation with all of you saying, why do we have HubSpot? Why do we have size? Why do we, and just like the list goes on and on. Why do we have all these things? And at some point you're going to be under a little bit of pressure to give up on either people or process or technology or probably not process technology, but you have to give up on something at cost. And are you ready to have that conversation? What hill are you willing to die on right now for your budget? And are you prepared to actually have that conversation in a way that allows you to maintain your credibility over time? Because I would imagine for a lot of you guys, if you think like, oh, I don't know if I can really justify this and feel good about myself, and I feel a little uncomfortable with it, you're going to probably just let that one go and you may regret it. But that's your customer right now in the same boat with your solution. I, and I, I'm going to pause on that note for a second because you, you sort of just made me think. So we put together this recession uh, uh, preparedness calculator, yeah. which you've seen. Yep. And one of the th things that we ask uh, the CMOs to do is to do an audit of their people, their programs, and their technology and sort of figure out right now what they have to have and what's nice yeah. to have, must have versus yeah. nice have. And yeah. what's so interesting about that is that, and I hadn't really made the leap as you've done, that's what your customers are doing. So if we go to, because in July, we spent the entire month talking about customer marketing, customer retention, customer, all of that, and why retention was so important. But now we can reframe that conversation. It's like, we should do it again, because the reframing is not just, are they using their your product or service to the fullest extent possible, but preventing them from dropping you which yeah. means they've got to be, you've got to move your product from must have, from nice to have to must have, and you got to do it in a very quick way. And it means providing the ammunition to your current customers to make your product defensible, right? That's and right. that's something that we hadn't, we subtly talked about it, but we didn't put up a, a pin in it. And I think that's really yeah. interesting. I want to put a pin on that right now. The good news is because you're going through this exercise on your own and you're looking at this, you can learn from that experience. If you look at every piece of software you have right now and audit them and you decide what you put in must have versus nice to have, and what was in your mind? What made it nice to have versus must have? Because that's what you need to take that and apply it to your own product or service. Well, and what's interesting, Drew, is I would imagine there's going to be this gray area where you guys would put it in a must have. So like something, again, it's something, but part of your MarTech stack that you would put in the must have category. You really need this and you can see the value. But then when you think about having that conversation out loud with your CFO under some really tight budget constraints, you think, yeah, but am I really confident in my ability to articulate it? I know we need this but can I truly articulate it in a way that doesn't make me sound crazy, dumb? And I mean, you guys don't sound crazy, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's like it, yeah. there's, there's a difference between I see the need versus I can articulate to the need, the need to someone outside of marketing who's in finance, who's just looking to cut 10%. That's your cut. So that's why I think it comes back to confidence. It's not just, do you see the, because I can give you all the ROI calculators until the cows come home, but are have I equipped you to go have that conversation around here are the outcomes that you right. and I, so so I'm I'm you now I'm gonna I'm gonna role play you guys as markets right so I'm sitting down with our CFO and saying you know we talk about here are the outcomes that we as an executive team agreed on as the things we're trying to achieve whether it's a certain percent of growth or market share steel whatever it might be here's the things we agreed on here are the three tools in our tool chest 
that are most important for achieving those outcomes. And let me explain why, because this one, and then you need to work from this tool does this, and I got to be able to ladder it up to that higher level outcome, right? So this particular tool helps us achieve this, this, and this. Those three things are important because it gets me this. This is important because it gets us that. And I'd be able to show that causal link and I can and, and have that conversation and ideally put numbers against it, put proof points against that, ideally yours. And unless you can have that conversation where you can ladder up and ladder down in terms of outcomes, you may feel it's important, but can you convey that it's important? That's the trick. Interesting. I, I'm just imagining uh, either a cheat sheet card or an SMS that goes out to every one of your customers right now who are the defenders. And these are probably people, by the way, who identify with your product or service really tremendously, like it's part of yeah. their, their existence, kind of depends on it. But giving them the ammunition, as you described, to defend yeah. the purchase. Worst case scenario, Drew, is what we're seeing right now is that we sell to a lot of value professionals and they're right now losing their job. So what do I do when that person who's able to have that conversation doesn't work at the company anymore? And now I've got to go have that conversation with the CFO. Do you see? Or or that CFO is going to have to have that kind of figure that out for him or herself. So there, this is where again being buttoned down on this stuff and having access to all these different people, I think, is. I, so and to some degree, you guys may be thinking like, gosh, I hope my sales team's thinking about this kind of stuff. But this is, I think, the degree to which we can do this through digital channels or the degree to which we can provide the produce the content, the talking points, the collateral that we can put in the hands of our sales reps or maybe our channel partners. But I would just run everything through this lens of how can we help our customers feel more confident in their ability to have these kinds of conversations in their company. The tough conversations. Uh, suddenly, I'm even that much more excited about getting everyone to take the uh, recession preparedness calculator because the the things that it talks about it on an internal level it, in ability to defend your budget is going to be based on your confidence that all the things that you're doing are working <laughs> to the fullest yeah. extent that the company, your CFO and your CEO believe they should be. And the less confident you are in the way you're spending the budget on people, programs, and technology, the more likely your budget's going to get cut, <laughs> right? So we can put it there. But the exercise that you're going through is going to be informative and help you get yourself prepared to do what this is what we call it sales enablement and we'll call it customer marketing enablement, right? And it's a different kind of customer enablement marketing because I don't think everybody's thinking, oh my God, our product could be cut. If somebody's looking for 10%, our product yep. could be cut. And so now suddenly that's a little bit different conversation than, hey, are you using it well? It's it's a little bit different than the upsell conversation. It um, is. And you know, and I think again, this is why I love, you know, I I spend so much time working with salespeople and sales leaders, but I, I, my Emotional home is marketing for and with you guys because we're storytellers, right? And I think that's the part of the critical aspect of this is be able to tell that compelling story with data, with evidence that is going to resonate across multiple stakeholders, all with different perspectives. So, so one of the things that we talk about in the beginning of the challenger customer, which is still true today, um, is one of the weirdest things we ever found in all my time at, at CEB and Gartner is that the better you get at positioning your offer to individual stakeholders, the less likely they are to buy the bigger solution. In other words, like personalization basically works against you. It's like I realize that's like gasoline on a fire for marketers. That ain't cool to say that out loud, right? And the reason why is because it's not just there's a lot of stakeholders involved in a purchase. It's not a numbers problem, although that number keeps going up. It's a diversity problem. The fact that the CFO is different than the head of marketing, is different than the head of operations, is different than legal and compliance and CISO. And they all have different metrics. They all have different dashboards. And unless they can come to a common understanding of what they're trying to do, they're just going to choose not to choose. So in sales, I talk about the track them all down, win them all over strategy. I got to get that person on board. And I'm going to personalize that that stakeholder and get him on board. And I got to personalize that stakeholder and get her on board. Now, once I get them, it's like one plus one plus one, I got them all on board. Well, it turns out equals zero, uh, unless they all can agree. So it's not about doing a better job connecting them to you. It's doing a better job of connecting them to each other. And I think that's where, again, these value conversations, we're talking about the metrics we choose, the, 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 the KPIs that we define, the outcomes that we um, articulate need to resonate across multiple stakeholders as a collective. It's it's like graduate school of, of value, right? It's 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 a more complicated, subtle art, but it's a critical one to figure out. So the Brent Adamson groupie in me will tell you that they are 2.2 <laughs> times less likely to close the sale if they've expressed personalized, customized messages to each of the decision makers. I believe that was the number. Um, Sounds vaguely your, right, yeah. Uh, in, in your yeah. book. Because uh, yeah. I 
pretty sure I put it in my book. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because at first marketers think, well, isn't the future all about personalization? But really, this is a step back and saying, no, for a moment, this is about the big story and having everybody see the same, that it's an elephant, right? It's not the blind men touching seven different parts of an elephant yeah. and wondering what it is. It's having making sure that everybody sees the, and at this point, everybody has the same confidence for that this product or service can do the same thing for the company that is important to them. So finding, so let me, again, super tactical, but I think at least what's conceptual, but it's still tactical is finding means for your customer stakeholders to interact with each other is such an interesting opportunity for us in sales and marketing. So on the sales side, it would be things like customer alignment workshops, like literally how can I get them all in a room, which these days, of course, is still hard because of residual pandemic. But I think through digital, it's actually super interesting, right? How can I create a digital experience that increases the likelihood of customer stakeholders talking to each other, of interacting with one another around a calculator, around a, a set of questions, around an assessment tool, around a, a readiness checklist. It's not like, God, I love us in marketing, right? So we built the readiness checklist and we put it out and we we gated it. Now we're like in 50,000 or 5,000 people downloads, there's 5,000 new leads in our funnel and we pass this off. To, this, is, this just can't be the world we live in anymore in marketing, right? The thing we care about is have we created a readiness checklist and have we have we de deployed it in such a way that we increase the likelihood, not of people downloading and looking at it, but of stakeholders downloading, looking at it, and then engaging their colleagues in a discussion around it. That's the magic. It's not the one person downloading and looking at it. It's the sharing. So if you think like, well, how the bleep am I supposed to make that happen as a marketer? One company we profiled a couple of years ago at Gartner was, um, they literally just had a share button on the piece of content. You just track like how many times does this piece of content get shared by one stakeholder to colleagues, for example. I, that's not going to solve everything I'm talking about, but it just the winners here are the creative ones. The winners here in marketing are the ones who come up with the answers to the questions I have, right? Which is like, how do I deploy a digital experience that increases the likelihood of my customer stakeholders interacting with each other as a result of that digital experience. And Drew, and again, I, don't, man, I, I don't have all the answers to that, but I think that's that's the thing to figure out. Right, and again, this is under the assumption that this is a large purchase decision. There are a lot of people involved in it. It's a committee and, and they have to come together. So on the calculator, going back to that, just as a place to uh, continue the conversation, we, t we talked about these sort of four buckets that would really show the essentialness of the brand in its sort of where are you, you know, in this must have versus nice to have in your customer's mind. The insulation, and this is an interesting one, the insulation is comes down to how likely are your customers to actually keep you, <laughs> right? Right. And how likely yeah. are they to upgrade you? That's part of it. Um, and it's also the internal belief that marketing works, right? And there are certain marketers on this call who can show not only pipe that, you know, the marketing touches, but marketing drives 60% of revenue, oh, yeah. right? Those folks yeah. are insulated. <laughs> In, in many ways, their, in, their budget is insulated, at least in the short term, until the targets start to go down, right? Because they've got two things. They've got customers who are going to renew because they love them and they can already answer the question, why I have you and why I can't live without you. There's this whole operations part of it. And I expect that that's going to have a major impact on MarTech world, right? Because you know, MarTech has, in in my mind, has has grown like unbelievably faster than almost any other budget area. And MarTech isn't programming. <laughs> MarTech isn't media. And so that'll be interesting. And then this sort of last area is the internalness of and the confidence that your employees and your, your leadership believes in in the brand. Well, actually, Joanna, can we, can we talk a little about this essential point? Because I think it's actually yeah. really important. And I, I, I'm guessing you guys are all there like me in your heads, but it's just so we all articulate it out loud is... um. Because the way you said it, and it's a natural, it's a natural inclination for all to say, how do I prove the essentialness of my solution? How do I prove the essentialness or how, that show that my brand or my product, my solution is essential? And then internally, how do I demonstrate that my team is essential and we shouldn't lay people off? If I may, I, I think there's a just a more productive way to articulate the same concept, which is it's not so much that you want to you want to demonstrate how essential your solution is. I would suggest the better way to think about it is how can I demonstrate how essential the outcome is that my solution contributes 
to. Does that make sense? And if it feels like I'm splitting hairs, I, I don't mean to be, but but the thing you want, let's take in the customer in the sales setting, the thing I want to convince my customers of is not that, because think about it. It's like, do I think my iPhone is essential because it's an Apple iPhone? No, I think my iPhone is essential because it allows me to accomplish certain tasks in an easy sort of way. If someone came out tomorrow with a better phone, I mean, is there a certain brand loyalty there? Yeah, but not if someone can help me do that even better, right? So I think customers are fickle to some degree, particularly in a recurring revenue model and you know, on a monthly basis. So the thing that we have to show is essential is we help you achieve this outcome. This is why that outcome matters more than anything else, or it matters a lot, it's essential. There we go. This is why this outcome is essential. And here's how we are directly connected to that outcome. It's, it's a two-step logic as opposed to a one-step logic. And oftentimes we short circuit it or short cycle it to, here's where I'm essential. I, I think that's where we can get ourselves in trouble because we wind up spending too much time talking about ourselves and our features and our speeds and our and our proof points and our customer raving fans or whatever it is, as opposed to let's go back to our customer and just remind them what are they trying to do and why does that matter? And here's how we help them make that happen. That, do you buy that, Drew? It's, it's a, is that, does it feel like a difference without a distinction without a difference or does it feel important? My mind, being the simple minded person that I am, struggles Stop. with the dis distinction. Um, but it's only because I have to process it and I need an example. I need a story that gets me there. Here's, I guess, the high level. The, 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 I guess the reason why, just years of watching this happen, is if we want to make our product essential, what do we wind up talking about? Our product. If we want to make our brand essential, what do we wind up talking about? We talk about our brand, right? But if we want to make sure that our customers consider a certain outcome to be essential, then we start talking to them about their business. And I think that's, I, I, it feels like when I say it like that, it seems like just dead straight obvious. Like we all kind of know that, but it's, it's, it's not in the principle. It's in the execution that where we kind of get tripped up because we say, oh, it's so important to get them to love us or like us or use us or, 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 you know, think we're amazing. So we, it, it's kind of like dating. It's like, I want you to think I'm amazing. So I spend all my time thinking about how, talking about how I'm amazing. It's like, that's usually the exact 180 degree different way to the, it's like the worst possible way to actually achieve the thing you're setting out to achieve. I got it. And, and what you really, if this is about not being the hero of your own story. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. You're helping, you're enabling your Yago. Bad example. You was, went to Shakespeare. I can't help you out there, man. I no, no, luck. I was. Actually, <laughs> I'm going to leave you on an to, island. I went on to one. Aladdin, actually. Oh, you're going to Aladdin. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were in a fellow land. We were at Disneyland. I'm so yeah, glad. exactly. <laughs> no. So, uh, okay. That makes sense completely. That, and it also, so, Oh, hold on. So, I, so Kristen asked a really good question, which is okay, Brett. Okay. Uh, she said, how do you measure success? And Chris, I'm, it's a tongue in cheek answer, but it's actually mean this, which is it doesn't matter how I measure success, right? So in other words, when it comes to marketing, it matters how the people who are holding the budget strings measure success. So I, but I, but all this is actually why this matters, right? Is I, and you guys do this already, I imagine, but sit down with your leadership team and say, what matters to us as a team? What matters to us as a company? And here's how I believe we as a marketing team are contributing because the answer is going to be contextual. It's going to be different and it's, and it's going to be articulated in your language, but you have to go through that exercise together. If that exercise, this is again, why the software that we use is so important because it's all based on a very fundamental principle that value is defined collaboratively, not unilaterally. And I think that matters in this world. So, so Chris, and I would suggest that you know how I measure success doesn't even matter inside my own company. What matters is how myself and my leadership teams we sit down and how do we measure success. And I, I think that's the same point there. And that feels kind of punditry now that I say it out loud. I don't I apologize if it does, but but I think it's actually a really important principle. I've totally thrown you off your your talk director. I no, apologize. No, not at all. So <laughs> this I, happens I, every time I, I come you know, on this, your show. <laughs> this is the problem with with a with a live show is that you have to think yeah. on your feet and and yeah. sometimes it. it you, you, there's too much information going in. So I'm going to jump ahead. Conversations that we've been having right now have yeah. been about CFOs saying budgets on hold in the, in the first quarter. I need you to start to look at trimming here or there, but I still need you to hit your numbers. And these yeah. are, by the way, not just for folks who don't have a predictive engine, even for ones who do have a predictive model where they can show marketing drives not just pipeline, but most often that's it, but they can drive revenue. They have a predictive model. They've all agreed that this model actually works. And yet they're being said, we we'll probably need to cut, there's probably 10% fat. And so the marketer's response is, well, there are some short-term things I could cut that probably won't have a big impact. They might have a longer-term impact, but otherwise they're being asked to be mag magicians, right? They're yeah. being asked to make something out of nothing or make more with less. 
And if they do make more with less, then they really have to admit the fact that they weren't spending as efficiently as they could have at the beginning. So what words of advice do you have for these CMOs right now who are looking at budget cuts, but not uh, outcome cuts? <laughs> They still are supposed to deliver the same number of leads into pipeline. They're still supposed to enable the salespeople in the same way with wonderful tools like you described with this, less staff and less budget. I, you look, I, I, this is hard. On this one, I'm just a guy. Do you know? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a researcher who's got bar charts I could show you to solve for this one. I, I, I think we're all kind of in this together. The one thing, you know, if I put on my empathy hat, Drew, I would suggest this is that you guys all know how that feels to you personally when you have that conversation. It feels frustrating. It feels scary. And I think there's this undercurrent to your point, Drew, you already mentioned, which is, well, if you're suggesting I can cut 10% and deliver the same result, you're, you're kind of suggesting I've been sandbagging. And I don't know about you, but I get resentful about that. Like, who the bleep are you to, you know, I mean, and then, but it creates this, it creates an emotional tension as much as a procedural tension in your company. The first thing that came to my mind, Drew, is that in the classic corporate world, things get cascaded. I would encourage you guys, maybe to state the obvious, be careful not to cascade that same sentiment down to your team. So as you as you think about leading your team and explaining the the fact that you're between a rock and a hard place, be careful not to inadvertently or maybe advertently create the same feeling among your team who you rely on to get your job done that your boss just created in you or your colleague or your peer in finance. And so maybe you just openly talk about it, look, which is these are tough times. I know we've been running at 100% already, or maybe 98%. Maybe it's temporary. I, there's this weird, you know, the, the quiet quitting sort of thing comes up here, which is like quiet quitting turns out like you were actually, you're not quite quitting because I'd be real careful with that, right? Because everyone's already doing their job. No one's quitting. You're just doing what I'm asked to do. So I would lean into process. I would lean into technology. How can we find ways to use this might be the place where you double down on technology not pull back if it can make you more productive if it can make you more efficient and, and by the way there may be headcount reductions as a result of leaning into technology that's again kind of where we're at i think that you can get more scale out of a value conversation we do with software than you can with people i mean, I, I definitively know you can get more scale out of it with process though and people but i also understand the potential human cost of that in terms of jobs. The physics here are hard, but I would just, as all of you are great human leaders, many of you are great human leaders, just I would encourage you as, as you think about how these conversations feel to you, think about how they'll feel to your team when you have them with them. Uh, just that's not a solution, is it, Drew? But it's something- No, it's great. It, it, it's a good place to wrap up. I, I think it's a good yeah. place to wrap up because you know basically what you're saying is don't kick the dog. <laughs> <laughs> right. If, if you're getting kicked, don't. But I love the empathy. And and I think this is part of what we're doing here, which is we're collectively feeling some pain, but also bubbling up solutions. And one of the things, the big themes that I took away from the call is thinking about the word confidence, both in yeah. terms of internally, like you're confident uh, as a CMO that you're doing everything you can to help deliver the outcomes. At the same time, you're giving your current customers the confidence they can to defend this. And then finally, you're giving your prospects the confidence they can to make this decision in a time where confidence is really hard to find. Yeah. Right. Because there's yeah. so much uncertainty. So and, when, and a lot of that that uncertainty is not the result of the economy. Because I, I would argue when the economy turns around or or we get more clarity on the, uh, the the decision complexity, the information overload, the value opacity are still there. The underlying long term impact or er, forces eroding confidence are irrespective of the economy, not because of it. So that's why it matters so much to solve for them. I think. Well, this. I'm confident. One, thank you very much for joining us. And I'm confident you're going to come back. <laughs> and we're going to have more to talk about. Uh, That's up to you the, guys. <laughs> yeah, but uh, So, Brent, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, I'm your host, Drew Neiser. And until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong. <laughs>